Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So this is part three of the Jonestown video and it's going to be a long one just because there's a lot to cover in this part and I didn't want to break it into four parts. I still might break this last part into two parts just to make the uploading easier but I will post them at the same time so that you can watch them and you don't have to wait. Okay, so let's get right in. If you have not watched parts one or two yet, please go ahead and watch those now. I'll put the link in the description. Just saying this, say nighty night and kiss me. Just hold me tight and tell me you'll miss me. While I'm alone as blue as can be. Dream a little dream of me. Okay, so remember Father Divine. We talked a little bit about Father Divine in the last part, and I think I told you a little bit about how Father Divine had been married to his wife. And then his wife died, and Father Divine wanted to marry somebody else or be with somebody else. So he told his entire congregation that his wife, Mother Divine, her soul had jumped into the body of this like 23-year-old white woman. And this woman's name was Edna. She was a Canadian. And since Father Divine died, she had taken over running his entire operation. So seven years after Father Divine's death, Jim Jones thinks he's going to go over to Pennsylvania and he's going to now take Father Divine's followers. And he's going to do this by telling them that Father Divine's spirit entered Jim's body. So Jim is actually now Jim Jones and Father Divine, and so that they should follow him because, of course, that's, that's normal, that's natural. Why wouldn't you? He took about 200 people and put them in his Greyhound buses and drove them down to Pittsburgh where they went to Father Divine's congregation, and Jim was like, hey... It's me, Father Divine. Let's, you know, restart what we had going on before. But I guess that these people weren't as stupid as Jim Jones thought they were, and they weren't having it. And neither was Edna, who had spent the last seven years, like I said, running this entire operation, and she knew it was a hoax. She'd taken part in the hoax when Father Divine had married her and said, his wife's soul was in this woman so she knew he was full of crap and you know she basically was like thanks but no thanks needless to say this takeover was not a success he did wrangle a couple people to like jump on the buses with him and drive back to california but i suspect being from this kind of area myself they were just tired of pennsylvania winters and were ready for some california sunshine Okay, so we know Jim Jones has an inner circle, people he trusts, people he sort of tasks with doing his dirty work for the most part, but he has an even tighter inner circle, and he calls this tight inner circle the planning commission. It was as if the more paranoid he got, the smaller the group of people that he trusted got. The People's Temple membership was growing into the thousands, and he needed these people. They were his lieutenants to send out into the masses and make sure everybody was doing what they were supposed to be doing. Nobody was feeling discontent. Nobody was talking about leaving. Nobody was talking against him. They were his spies that he sent out to keep an eye on everybody, keep everybody in line, and to report back to him if people weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. California was where the People's Temple transformed from a small Christian group to a huge political and social movement. He incorporated the People's Temple, opening up locations in San Francisco and Los Angeles. The timing was perfect for somebody like Jim Jones to show up in a place like San Francisco. They settled in the Fillmore district of San Francisco, and this was a mainly black, poverty-stricken neighborhood. Justin Herman, the head of the regional office of the Housing and Home Finance Agency in San Francisco, he had just gone on a rampage through the city, redeveloping the area and removing over 10,000 people, most of them poor and black, from their homes. The downtrodden, the people who had been removed from their homes without any notice or any care, they were feeling abandoned by the government and the people in power in San Francisco. They were feeling like nobody cared about them. And then, of course, enigmatic Jim Jones walks on the scene to show them that somebody does. Jones' massive following and loyal following eventually brought him to the attention of San Francisco's elite especially the politicians of the city. They could see the amount of power and control he had over people, and they recognized how much they could use that to their own advantage. 
as politicians typically do, instead of seeing thousands of people that were influenced that they could help, they saw thousands of people that were influenced that they could use. Congressional powerhouse Phil Burton could feel his mouth watering when he looked at Jim Jones and his multiple loyal followers. He set up a meeting between Jones and his friend George Moscone, who was running for mayor, and within no time, Moscone's campaign headquarters was staffed and run by 200 Temple members. Jim Jones even kindly arranged for buses of Temple members and congregates to be bused to polling locations so that they could cast their vote for George. Sometimes even more than once. Sometimes several times. Of course the election would go in Moscone's favor, and he actually won the mayoral race by 4,000 votes. So it is widely believed and accepted that without People's Temple and Jim Jones, he never would have won that election. Now of course, helping to clinch the race for the new mayor of San Francisco gave Jim Jones an ego boost that was already feeding a ginormous ego, and he never let George forget the help he'd given him in San Francisco. George Moscone was a good man, and he really was what the city needed at that time, but Jim basically turned him into a puppet, and he ruined him like he did everybody that he came into contact with. He never let this guy forget that he owed him a debt. He never let him forget that he was only where he was because of the help of Jim Jones. George Moscone basically started his time in office with a weight on his shoulders that represented a deal made with the devil. He made a deal with the devil and now he had to make good on it. Jones didn't feel like helping George win the race was enough of leverage on him, so he would actually like invite him to parties, get him drunk, hook him up with women, and then the next day he would call him and he'd say, hey, it was really great seeing you last night at this party, but by the way, that girl that you were with last night, she was actually underage, so... Essentially, I set you up and now I own you. In October of 1976, George Moscone named Jim Jones chairman of the San Francisco Housing Committee. And in typical Jim Jones fashion, Jim would start placing temple members in positions throughout the housing committee and kind of even in other forms of government too, you know, because he had connections now, he could get people in where he wasn't able to get people in before. So he was placing people strategically throughout the political structure of San Francisco so he would have his finger on the pulse of everything that was happening. It's actually brilliant. No one even knew it was happening until it was too late. He became known as a man who could fix elections, especially among the Democrats. He was very popular and widely used. Harvey Milk was a big fan of Jim Jones. Big fan. He once sent him a letter saying, Our paths have crossed. They will stay crossed. It is a fight I will walk with you into. Later, he would tell a friend who mentioned she'd had a strange experience with People's Temple, make sure you're nice to the People's Temple. They're weird and they're dangerous, and you never want to be on their bad side. So it's pretty clear to me from that that he knew there was something off about these people, but he still publicly and privately supported Jim Jones and his followers. And Harvey Milk was a really impressive politician in his time as well. He did a lot for the community in San Francisco, so it's just crazy that these kinds of little tidbits, you don't ever really hear about Jim Jones, how popular he was among the political elite in San Francisco. Like, nobody ever tells you this stuff. I don't know if these politicians actually liked Jim or respected Jim or if they feared him, knowing his influence, that he would either make or break them and their political careers were too important to kind of put personal feelings in front of professional ones. And as much as Jim loved his politicians, friends, letters, and sweet nothings whispered in his ear, he didn't want their private affection and attention. He wanted their public adoration. He needed everybody to know that Jim Jones was an important person. So he actually threw himself 
a banquet in his own name, threw it himself at people's temple, and he like decked out the place with linen tablecloths and candles and a beautiful menu, and he invited all of San Francisco's elite, and they showed up. The DA was there, the ADA was there, the mayor was there, congressmen, lawyers, senators, everybody just filling up the people's temple for their new buddy, Jim Jones. Now, Willie Brown was a political force in his own right. He was a very important person, especially in African-American history. Willie Brown would recover from his Jones fanboy status and eventually go on to serve as the first black mayor of San Francisco. He was San Francisco's mayor from 1996 to 2004. And he did a really good job as mayor. His tenure was marked by a lot of good things for San Francisco, such as real estate development, um, city beautification. He was around when the whole dot-com era of San Francisco exploded, and you know San Francisco and the Silicon Valley area, they're very much into that kind of stuff. But he did a really good job. And for somebody to be such a huge Jones supporter, because he was one of the biggest Jim Jones supporters that have ever existed. Even after Jim Jones started going downhill as far as his reputation, Willie Brown still supported him and spoke out for him. For him to go on to do so many good things and to become mayor after that, because I feel like that would have been political suicide at this point. You know, you're such a supporter of this guy and the stuff he ends up doing. But anyways, at the time, Willie Brown was an assemblyman in San Francisco. He introduced him like this. Let me present to you a combination of Martin King, Angela Davis, Albert Einstein and Chairman Mao, Jim Jones. Oh man, he was like kissing his ass hard. And with Jim Jones' ego being expanded to the point of no return, he truly now believes he can get away with anything. He has the power, the control, he has connections, he's somebody important, he's got the government behind him. He can do anything he wants and he basically just starts using his entire congregation as like his playthings. He starts to separate them from anybody important to them. He's very threatened by familial relationships. Any relationship that this person has that would be considered more important than the relationship they have with him, he has to put a stop to it. He begins to isolate members of the People's Temple away from their family, even if their family is actually a part of the People's Temple. This is the same thing an abusive spouse will do to you if you are with them, but they don't want you to be with anybody else. They'll start saying your family is mean to them so that your family isn't around because you don't wanna be around your family when they're mean to your significant other. They'll start making things up that your family doesn't appreciate you. They don't love you as much as I do. I'm the only one who cares about you. I'm the only one who has the same interests as you do. It's very, very detrimental. And so many people fall for it. He wanted to be your only friend. He wanted to be your mother. He wanted to be your father. He wanted to be your brother. He wanted to be your sister. He wanted to be your lover. He wanted to be everything to these people. There were public humiliations and punishments, and these would get worse once he actually had them in Jonestown, but they started in San Francisco, and they started small, but it was still shocking the kind of stuff he got away with on American soil when he was a very like important politician in person in the city. He would have you stand up and then verbally just berate you. He would tell you you were useless. He would tell you you were nothing. I don't understand why you're even here. There's no point for you. Just the typical verbally abusive kind of stuff that breaks people down. He would bring these people to tears. They'd be sobbing before he would walk down wrap his arms around them and say, this is for your own good. Father loves you. Don't worry. You're okay. This is such textbook abuse that you would see between a parent and a child where you scream at them and you break them down and you make them feel like absolute crap. And then you're like, sorry, but you know, I had to yell at you or you just were never going to understand. It's really problematic. It's really traumatic for people. And he was doing this in front of hundreds of people and nobody said anything. Eventually the punishments would escalate into what he liked to call catharsis, where he would literally have temple members beat the crap out of each other while he sat there and egged them on and laughing in this super creepy, high-pitched, weird laugh. <laughs> And he would 
be like one guy, like, hey, you did something wrong, guy, and you stand here, and now I'm gonna have five or six people just beat the crap out of you while everybody watches. He would have boxing matches where he would literally put these on for entertainment where somebody who'd been doing something wrong would be put in the ring and then just be allowed to be beat on by multiple people over and over again. And and no matter how much he fought back or how much he tried to hold his own, it would not end until Jim Jones said it was gonna end. And Jim Jones didn't say it was gonna end until the person was beaten to a bloody pulp on the floor, basically. He made one woman strip down naked in front of the entire congregation and basically make fun of her and tell her she was overweight. And then he made her go and put her entire body into a pool of ice until he told her she could get out. This is dangerous. This is starting to mess with people's bodies as well as their minds. There was a plethora of other horrendous acts that I cannot and will not repeat. If you want to look more into it, I will put some resources in the description box. So people were working all day, signing over their paychecks to Jim Jones. At first it started off with 20% of their paychecks. Eventually that kept raising and raising and raising until they were just signing over their entire paychecks to him every week, every month. Everything they made went to him. They had already signed over their homes to him, all their valuables, even sometimes their children and he took everything from them. They worked all day, they went to meetings all night. They were getting like two, three, four hours of sleep a night, if that. In fact, it became like a fun competition within the temple to tell other people how long you'd slept. And so they would be like, well, I slept four hours last night. And you would be like, ha, gotcha, I slept two hours last night. And then somebody else would be like, I haven't slept in three days. And this was supposed to make you seem more loyal, more devoted to the cause. The less you slept, the better a temple member you were. It reminds me of the conversation that my husband and I have like every morning because Bella wakes up a lot at night and you know, he'll be like, I'm so tired in the morning. And I'll be like, you're tired? <laughs> I'm sorry, were you up every single hour? I think I got three hours of sleep. And he was like, well, I heard you get up every single hour and that woke me up. So I probably only got like two and a half hours of sleep. And I'll be like, well, come to think of it, I had to take a bathroom break and then I got a drink of water. So I probably only got two hours of sleep. So we like are so exhausted and miserable. We compete with each other in the morning of who's more exhausted and miserable. On top of all this, now they're being beaten and humiliated and you ask, why didn't they leave? Why didn't they leave? I know this is one of the main questions. Well, you have to understand now, a lot of people came to people's temple with nothing. And the only reason they had a roof over their heads or food in their stomachs or a job was because of Jim Jones. He wasn't just their preacher, he was their father, he was their employer. He'd given them a job, he'd given them a home. He was everything and he had everything and they had nothing, so if they left, there'd be nothing to go to. A lot of other people who had come in with property or money, they'd already signed that all over to Jim. So they would have nothing if they left. And it wasn't that bad yet. Now, for me and you, we obviously know it was that bad, right? But for these people who have nothing if they leave, they're thinking, it's not really that bad. We can make it through this, it'll get better. They didn't have any money, they weren't sleeping, they weren't thinking straight. You would know if you've ever been sleep deprived, especially when it's a prolonged time period of being sleep deprived, your brain doesn't work correctly. You can barely function your body to move it and tell what to do, and your brain barely works. So Jim Jones is everything. He's their faith healer, their father, their savior in most cases, and he also has all their shit. San Francisco is going great for Jim, right? He's having a great time playing puppet master with the politicians, being wined and dined by everybody. But as all good things do, it came to an end. And this was a slow demise. It was slow, but it was steady. Because in 1972, the first piece of bad press would be released about the People's Temple. An ordained priest and religion editor for the San Francisco Examiner, Lester Kinsolving, wrote a series of eight articles about abuse of power in people's temple. He ripped Jim Jones apart, basically citing unethical business practices, the way he treated people, that he was like stealing their money. He was especially upset and agitated about Jim Jones, who claimed he could raise the dead because he said he was taking advantage of people's religious beliefs. Even pointed out that he had like guards following him around, armed guards following him around all the time. Basically, kin solving, he spilled the tea on People's Temple. 
And People's Temple responded, of course, because even though Jim Jones couldn't send his followers over to Ken Solving's Twitter or Instagram account to verbally abuse and attack him, he could have them write millions of letters to the examiner's office demanding them to retract the articles. Now, the examiner would post four of those articles, but they never posted the last eight. I think they did get a little bit of backlash from not only the People's Temple's followers, but also from Jim Jones's fancy new political friends. If you want to read all eight articles, I do have a link for that. I did read them all. They're well written and entertaining. I enjoyed them and I will put that link in the description box. In 1973, eight members would leave the fold and this was the first group defection to ever happen to the People's Temple. They wrote a letter to Jim Jones citing their reasons for leaving. There was a group of eight young people who knew he was a hypocrite, that he preached equality, yet his inner circle was all white. And so they wrote him a letter pointing all of these contradictions and hypocrisies out. And they had good reasons. But it still bothers me because these people didn't have the balls to say to Jim, this is your fault, this is because of you, it all stems from you. They were still too afraid of him and maybe still believed in him a little too much to actually directly say that to him. They blamed his lieutenants, his inner circle, his committee for all the things that were happening that made them wanna leave. They told him that even though he preached racial equality and socialism, that they didn't feel things were really going that way. Most of the people in his inner circle were white. I think there was one black person as in, in his inner circle, so they were like offended by that. Obviously, if you say that you view everybody the same, why does it seem like the majority of the people that you trust and have around you are white, not black? Money talks just as much as outside of the temple walls. And if somebody would have an issue or they would say, hey, so-and-so gets to get away with this, why can't I? They would be responded to by saying, well, so-and-so brings in a lot of money. And when you bring in that much money, then you can do whatever you want too. They ended this extensive long letter, which I will also link in the description if you wanna see it, but they ended the letter with, the eight of us believe in historical materialism. We feel that you came to the people giving them the greatest reason to live, the greatest reason to die, the greatest reason to fight, socialism. We have another name for it. However, you can't do it all. You can't move unless your followers realize the necessity to shape history themselves. This is again where the staff has failed. They are, to the most part, white, egotistical people maintaining a hierarchy, hierarchy, <laughs> not allowing you to take the reins and go ahead full steam, holding you back, saying it's not time, having to be effed, degrading people, especially if they have a little knowledge about socialism. All this leads us to the conclusion that the staff is chicken shit. There is a point where you have to be cautious and compromise, yet there's a limit. We will not talk against people's temple to anyone because of you and a few innocent people who may be hurt. You're the one that showed us the way. You're the one that boldly challenged capitalism and put a vision in our hearts. You're the one that proved to us that nothing is impossible. This is exactly how we feel. Nothing is impossible. So once again, I recognize their bravery for leaving and for even saying anything to Jim because me, I would have just, I would have been out. I wouldn't have said anything. Nobody would have ever heard from me or seen me again. But they're still kissing his ass, right? They're still reinforcing his beliefs that he's right, he can do no wrong, he hasn't done anything wrong, and they're still allowing him to project all the things that he's done wrong onto everybody else. So after the eight members leave, the temple is a flutter with gossip, of course. Everybody's talking about it because they're bored and there's nothing else to talk about. And Jim's paranoia and anger and anxiety, they grow and grow and grow with every new whisper that he hears. He basically flipped out on his planning commission and said, this is your fault. First of all, you should have seen this coming. How did you not know that these people were feeling this way and that they were about to leave? This is your fault. You gotta keep a better eye on people. So from now on, we're cracking down. There's not gonna be one thing that happens in this place without us knowing about it. He had Carolyn Layton hand out blank sheets of paper to every single person on the planning commission and have them sign the bottom of it. Jim told them if they angered him, if they left, if they did anything wrong, he could just fill in the papers with whatever he wanted, any kind of confession, any kind of horrible thing, and they had already signed it, so they would be screwed. One of the members, Tim Carter, who was actually a survivor of the Jonestown Massacre, he said it just seemed like another test, kind of like the wine thing. It was just a test of loyalty. He didn't think that it would even be legally allowed in court, and it probably wouldn't have been, honestly. It was just kind of a mind test. 
But he just was like, whatever, we'll sign the paper. We don't think anything of it. It's just another one of Jim's silly little tests to see if we're loyal to him and we are, so who cares? I'm gonna talk really quickly about another Temple member, Peter Witherspoon, just because there's no other place to fit him in and I think it's important to talk about his story a little bit to show you what an absolutely bananas operation these people were running. Peter Witherspoon was a known and convicted pedophile. He was allowed membership to People's Temple anyways, but they let him know that none of his shenanigans would be tolerated. So first of all, just knowing that this guy's a child molester, that he's a pedophile and you still are like, yeah, come in, just don't mess up, okay? Like that's ridiculous, it's so irresponsible and it just shows you how little Jim and even the people of his inner circle really cared about the other people and the children, the most vulnerable of the people in the temple. They didn't really care. Of course, Witherspoon would go on to lure a 10 year old boy into doing something with him that he shouldn't have been doing. And instead of handing him over to the police and letting them take care of it, People's Temple wanted to handle it internally. Often these kinds of places do. This is a trademark of cults. They handle their own stuff internally, kind of like the military. So he was brought into a back room and he was tortured. And I'm not going to say exactly what happened to him because once again, it's not something I want to repeat. I will post a link if you're interested. But needless to say, the man was incapacitated for days and he had to use a catheter for quite a while. I'm a big proponent of children's rights and I detest anybody who hurts children, so I'm not really against what they did to Pedo Pete. But the fact is, this man should have been turned over to the authorities where he could have been taken off the streets. After they did this to him, they put him right back into the temple life and I don't know if he went on to do anything again. I can only assume he did just because I know that somebody like this doesn't really get healed or get better, especially without therapy and medication and lots and lots of like watchful eyes. So it bothers me that they didn't turn him over to the police after they tortured him. Loyal temple members were also punished for perceived wrongdoings. A woman named Lori Ephraim who came to People's Temple really quiet, really meek, she was treated so badly by Jim Jones, and I don't know why. One day during a normal, late night, exhausting PC meeting, Jim Jones was going on and on about how the sexual demands that had you know, been put on him were getting to be too much, that it was just too much for one man to satisfy all these women. And for some reason, he asked for everybody who was in the room to raise their hands if they'd slept with him. So a lot of people in the room raised their hand, right? But not Lori, because she hasn't been with Jim yet. But most people thought that she had a crush on him and you know she wanted to be with him and he singled her out and he was like, look at Lori. She's been hitting on me for months. She's coming on to me all the time. I'm exhausted. And he was like, what do you think you have to offer me? Take your clothes off. So he made her take her clothes off, get completely naked in front of the whole planning committee. And he then simply said, if I had a list of people I didn't wanna sleep with, you would be at the top of it. And then he made her sit there the entire rest of the meeting naked, just standing there naked. And the meeting went on for several more hours. A few days later, one of the inner circle would approach Lori and say, you know, sorry about that. Jim feels bad, but he really had to do it. Like it's for your own good. And Lori was just like, no problem. It's okay. I understand. Even though a lot of people were appalled by the treatment of Lori, who was a really unproblematic person in the temple, they thought that Jim had the weight of the world on his shoulders and if he had to blow off steam this way to make him feel better, it would make everybody's life better. And that was just her, her service to give to Jim. Every time he would pull a stunt like this and the stunts would get crazier and crazier, I really think he was just waiting for somebody to be like, enough, this has gone too far. Nobody ever did. He never stopped and he really began to believe once again that he could get away with anything, even murder. I think he began to believe his own lies that he was truly God. The next story is one of those how the mighty have fallen stories. So in 1973, the LA Police Department had gotten a lot of reports of gay men hanging out in certain areas trying to solicit other men for sex. So the specific areas were MacArthur Park and the West Lake Movie Theater. Both of these areas were about a little bit less than a mile from People's Temple in Los Angeles. Their Los Angeles branch, because they're incorporated now. The police department began sending plain clothed police officers undercover to hang out in the park and the movie theater and see if they could catch somebody doing this, because this is illegal 
and it was illegal then, it's still illegal now, and I guess it's a big deal then, especially. So they wanted to hang out and catch these people doing it. So one day, this undercover officer, he's just sitting in the balcony at the Westlake Movie Theater watching a movie, I think it was Dirty Harry, and a guy, like a single guy that's just standing over there kind of like beckons to him, and so the police officer gets up and walks into the bathroom, and this guy follows him. This man then proceeds to pull down his pants and participate in an act of self-love in front of the undercover police officer. So the man's obviously arrested, put in cuffs, brought to the police station where he is then charged with lewd conduct. This man was Jim Jones. He's in a little bit of hot water, right? But he's not worried, he's not bothered, he's Jim Jones. He goes to his doctor and he gets a note saying that he has an enlarged prostate and in order to reduce the pain and pressure from this prostate, his doctor told him to jump up and down and run in place often when he's having problems with his large prostate. And that's what he was doing when the police officer saw him. Not the other thing, he was just running in place to help his prostate. A week later, an LA judge agrees to dismiss the case. Well, now Jim wants the record sealed, right? He doesn't want anybody to ever know this happened. And at first they're like, no, you're not a minor. Only minors can get their records sealed. But he brings Tim Stone in, his super strong legal counsel, and Tim Stone fights and argues to get these record seals. And somehow, I'm not sure, but the same judge who agreed to dismiss the case also agreed to have the records destroyed. I guess this is what happens when you have friends high up in the political world who you've helped win elections, I guess you just get off of every charge. <laughs> it was really bad wording. But anyways, the police officer who caught him and arrested him was kind of pissed and he was like, no, I know what he was doing in front of me. He was not jumping up and down. He was not running in place. I know what he was doing. And he like actually filed a complaint to have this whole charge brought back and he was declined. So a combination of losing followers, the article in the examiner, all this legal stuff going on, it made Jim feel more and more like they needed to go someplace else, that San Francisco wasn't for them anymore and maybe the United States wasn't for them anymore. They had to find a new place to be, to live in peace. Basically, he wanted to bring his followers to a place that was so isolated that they could never leave and nobody could ever see them to write stories about them in the paper. He leases 3,800 acres of land in Guyana and he begins construction on Jonestown. He told all his followers back home, right, that, that eventually he was gonna bring them to the promised land, that they were gonna go someplace that nobody could touch them, nobody could bother them, they could just live and work in peace. And he kept preaching to them this promised land. So he's switched a little bit from his older preaching style where he says, it's all about today, what can I do for you today? Forget about what's gonna happen in the future, forget about what happens after you die. I wanna help you today, what do you need from me today? He's kind of moved away from that and he's more in like the one day things will be good for us, one day when we're out from under the suppression, when we're out from under people who wanna hurt us, then in the promised land, we'll be good again. He told them all the bad things that had been written about them in that Examiner article, all the bad press and publicity, that was all a conspiracy to destroy what they'd all created because the American government didn't want them to bring socialism back or bring it to America because it was never in America, right? can't bring something back, it was never there. Jim Jones needed Guyana, and Guyana needed Jim Jones and the People's Temple. They had just gained their independence from Great Britain, and because of the newly found independence, they didn't have an army. And they'd been in a land battle with Venezuela for some time. When they lost Great Britain's support, they gained their freedom, which was great, but they also kind of were left with a little bit of an issue. They thought that having a bunch of Americans right on the border there between Venezuela and Guyana would prevent the Venezuelans from attacking and invading because they wouldn't want to get involved with any American citizens and cause the American government to come after them. The People's Temple would essentially be a human shield between two neighboring countries who disliked each other very much. And I'm sure nobody ever told them that that's what they were and that's what their purpose was. To Guyana. So Jim sends about a dozen people out to start building Jonestown, but he greatly misunderestimated the time it would take to build this place and also the time that he had left before shit hit the fan in San Francisco. 
Jonestown wasn't supposed to be completely finished until 10 years after they started building it. And even at that point, it was only supposed to house about a 600 people. A couple important key events hastened Jim Jones's departure for Guyana. Grace Stone left the People's Temple in 1976 and she was unable to take her son John Victor Stone with her. Part of this was because when children were born, they were typically taken from their mothers and given to other families because children were raised communally here. So everybody kind of raised everybody's children. It gives a whole new meaning to the words it takes a village because these kids were not ever really kept with their parents. They were given to other people to raise and then kind of everybody just pitched in and helped. So she didn't have a lot of access to John John. Another reason was she was really afraid to take John with her at first because she knew that if she left, her life would be in danger. And she knew if her son was with her that his life might be at risk too. But as soon as she reached safety, she would start the fight to get back John Victor Stone. And she didn't know at the time, but this would be a long and impossible task in the end. A year later, her husband, her estranged husband, Tim, he actually joined her in this fight because he too had defected from People's Temple. Some of the most important defections to happen in this temple was Greystone and Tim Stone. Him leaving caused a lot of anger and resentment in Jim Jones. With Tim Stone's help, because he was an excellent lawyer, Grace finally regained custody of their son. But by that time, Jim Jones had already spirited him away to Jonestown in Guyana. John Victor Stone would never leave Jonestown. Joyce Shaw, another temple member, would also defect in 1976. After the whole poison in the wine thing, she didn't really find that funny and she wasn't really feeling the whole people's temple vibe anymore. She made her plan to go to work, leave directly after work, get right on a bus, and get the hell out of Dodge. When she got to safety where she was going, she called her husband, Bob Houston. She'd left him behind as well as his two daughters, and she begged him to come and meet her. She didn't find out until later that the line she was calling him on was bugged by the People's Temple and they heard every word she said to him and every word he said to her. Within weeks, Bob Houston would be found mysteriously dead. Apparently, he'd fallen asleep on some railroad tracks and been run over by a train. I don't know how probable that sounds to you, but that's what his cause of death was. Of course, Joyce Shaw believes that his death was the work of the People's Temple who were punishing her for leaving and making sure that he never would. She returned to San Francisco and with the help of Bob's father, who was a photographer for the Associated Press, they would get the word out. And Bob's father actually knew Congressman Leo Ryan, which is how he initially got on the scene of Jim Jones and the People's Temple. On August 1st, 1977, an article was written by Marshall Kildruff and Phil Tracy and published in New West Magazine. With the help of 10 previous members, including Grace Stone, the writers pieced together what was really going on behind the scenes of Jim Jones's church. It ended with a very compelling argument of why we should be investigating and looking into Jim Jones and the People's Temple. Right before that article came out, the editors of New West claimed that their offices had been burglarized, or they believed they'd been burglarized. It seemed like somebody had broken in, and the only thing that was disturbed was one of the files on the computers about the People's Temple. There was never any proof that a break-in occurred, and in fact, I think it turned out that the break-in actually was a person who worked there who forgot their keys and crawled through a window and like knocked into the computer at the time, and that's what happened, but... It didn't really matter because just the suggestion that Jim Jones and his church would break into magazine headquarters to stop an article about them from coming out gave it all the press that it needed. And people were curious to see, the public wanted to know what would be so bad about this article that James Jones and his followers would want to put a stop to it coming out. When this article hit, it was huge. I mean, a lot of politicians who had previously thrown their support behind him kind of shut up, except for Willie Brown, who was still on Team Jones. Add to that Grace and Tim Stone's very public custody battle because Tim Stone wasn't backing down and he was basically talking to anybody who would ask. He was telling everybody everything they wanted to know. Everybody was talking to the press. Everybody was making it as well known as possible what was going on. So before the article even came out in New West Magazine, Jim knew it was coming out, he got on a plane with John Victor Stone and he flew to Guyana and went to Jonestown and he brought along with him, 
like a thousand people. So Jonestown wasn't even built at this point. Really, they maybe had a couple houses up, but it took them six months to just build a road through the jungle so they could get cars and supplies and machines and to even do the building. They had to deal with that first, then they started building the whole town, and then all of a sudden Jim Jones shows up with a thousand people, far more than Jonestown could ever have housed or fed. He brought with him all of his children and Carolyn Layton, his right hand lady, but he left Marceline back home in San Francisco and he said, you need to run things here. I don't need you in Jonestown. I just wanna make sure like things are still okay here. A group in the United States begins to form called the Concerned Relatives Group. This group consisted mostly of former temple members, critics of Jones and the People's Temple and former politicians who didn't either like him anymore or had never liked him to begin with. John Barbagallata, the man who had lost the mayoral race because of Jones's interference, he was one of the biggest like outspoken enemies and opponents of Jim Jones and People's Temple. He had a problem with according to him, the foster kids and the checks being sent to them. So a lot of the people that Jim had initially sent first over to Guyana to start building were these young strapping like teenagers and kids. But a lot of these kids were foster kids who were still getting sent checks to the families who had agreed to take care of them. Now, most of these families were sitting here in the United States, but these kids were doing slave labor over in Guyana and the checks were going to Jim Jones. So there was a lot of stuff that didn't make sense, a lot of kind of fraudy stuff going on. And Barbara Galato used that as like a reason of why he was interfering and why he was involved. Really, I think he was just pissed that Jones basically lost him the mayoral race, but Probably both, probably a little bit of both. He was also sending members of the temple to Panama and other places in Europe with cash strapped to them under their clothes so they could deposit it in foreign banks. He was crazy, but he was not stupid. He knew it wasn't gonna be long before America tried to seize his assets and he wanted them as spread out as possible. Now, Larry Schacht was a drug addict that Jim Jones had previously taken in, cleaned up, and, you know, gotten him a job. He had sent him actually to medical school, and Larry Schacht became Dr. Larry Schacht, which is so weird to me. Because of the fact that Dr. Larry had been at one time this drug addict living on the streets with no prospects and no hope, he owed everything to Jim Jones. He would have done everything anything for Jim Jones because now he was a doctor, he was respected, he had education and you know he had people who looked up to him and he owed that all to Jim. He was actually the man who came up with the cyanide concoction that would eventually kill the entire people's temple. Something about this really sticks out to me because I often hear people talk about Jonestown and say it as if this was a last minute decision of Jim Jones, that he was really stressed out about Congressman Leo Ryan coming to Jonestown and he wanted to just do something about it and he snapped. This was not a last minute decision. Don't ever let anybody tell you it was. He was having this man prepare this recipe for months. He brought him to Jonestown specifically for this reason and they were in Jonestown for over a year before this happened, before he killed them all. So this was not something that just happened spur of the moment. And he's like, well, we happen to have some cyanide, let's mix something up. They were planning this for a while. Jonestown was, in theory, at first, a cool place to live if jungle communist living is your thing, which it is not my thing. I don't really even like to camp. But people were digging it, right? They were like out there in the jungle, they were working with their hands. A lot of these people were city dwellers before, they'd never really been in the wilderness and it made them feel good to be out in the fresh air, doing something, making something out of nothing. And some people really enjoyed it, some not so much. But besides that, there was music and singing and dancing all of the time. There was always kids running around and playing. Like that's all these kids did all day is, you know, they would go to school, but then they'd be running around playing with their friends, laughing, having the best time because this would be an awesome place for kids, honestly. Growing up in a jungle kind of utopia like this where everybody's around you working and you just get to run around all the time playing with horses and ostriches and stuff, it's awesome. However, a lot of people were surprised to find themselves dropped in the middle of a jungle when they were promised a tropical paradise. This was not a tropical paradise. It was hot. It was steamy. There was mosquitoes everywhere. There was no cabanas laying out on the beach with the ocean breeze ruffling through your hair while you drank orange juice. You were working your ass off from morning till night. 
And even though this wasn't what people expected, there was still a waiting list for people to get into Jonestown. They must not have been told yet that it wasn't that fun because all their mail in and out was being opened and checked and edited basically. So if you sent something out that you weren't supposed to say, you would get in trouble, number one, and we'll get to that in a minute, but you would also be forced to rewrite what you were saying to something that Jim Jones thought it was appropriate for you to say, and then you could send it. So of course, no actual news is getting out and no actual news is getting in. There was only one way in and out of Jonestown essentially, and that was Port Ketuma. This port would allow you to either sail or fly to Georgetown, which was the capital of Guyana. And that is where you could, you know, hopefully find somebody to help you, but you'd have to get through the jungle first. And this jungle was so thick, when you were in it, you couldn't see the sky. And there's poisonous snakes and jungle cats and a multitude of other things that are just waiting to crawl out and kill you when you're in the jungle. So it didn't happen a lot. People didn't go in the jungle. Cabins at Jonestown were overcrowded, obviously. There would be times where there would be like 18 people in one cab and you'd basically be sleeping on top of each other. You couldn't go to the outhouse, the bathroom, without waiting in a line of people to use it. The showers were crude outdoor structures and you didn't want to open your mouth because it would make you sick, don't drink the water kind of thing. Jones himself had a large private cabin with an attached bathroom, a refrigerator where he could have his soda pop and a little fan to keep it cool in there. And he lived there with Carolyn Leighton, another woman named Maria who will become more important later, chemo and of course Jen Victor Stone. He had an actual bed with like sheets and a mattress and a generator and he lived in a lot better comfort than his fellow people did, which was not the socialist way at all. While he's in Guyana, he's super paranoid the US government's going to come after him, so he's having daily shipments of guns come in, and just one or two at a time, but he would use the word Bibles as a code over the CB radio. Like, how many Bibles are you sending us today? You know, but he would be talking about guns, because he thought it would be not weird if a church was talking about ordering Bibles, but definitely weird if a church was talking about ordering guns, which Jim, you were right. It's weird that a church should be ordering guns. The social security office had stopped sending its checks to elderly residents because they were living in Guyana and not the United States. And that money made up a big chunk of what the People's Temple was bringing in as far as revenue. Now it was costing $600,000 a month to keep Jonestown running and they just didn't have it anymore. Well, Jim Jones had it. He had millions of dollars. He could have just kept that place going for a lot longer than you would have thought, but he didn't want to use any of that money. He wanted to use everybody else's money. New arrivals would be checked thoroughly when they arrived in Jonestown, which they thought was really weird. They would go through their luggage, take anything valuable that they could sell, because once again, money was tight. Um, family heirlooms, jewelry, wedding rings, whatever, they would take that, they would sell it. And they would also take their passports, their money, and their ID. So they were really stuck here. At first, Jim thought that they could sell excess crops to make revenue, but there was no excess crops. There wasn't even enough crops to feed the people who lived there. They didn't have any food. It was just too hard to keep up with the demand. So Jim basically opened like a little Santa's workshop in Jonestown and had people making toys that they would then send to Georgetown to be sold in open air markets. And they were making, you know, a couple thousand dollars a month on this, but it wasn't anywhere near to what they owed or what they were in deficit of. So it wasn't really helping that much. The place was rigged with loudspeakers and sometimes it would be playing music like Earth, Wind and Fire or something jazzy but not too crazy. Most of the time though, it was just Jim ranting and raving through the loudspeaker, elaborating on what he had talked about at a meeting or just sometimes playing a recording of himself talking because he was too drugged up or tired at this point to even get on the loudspeaker and talk. Jim's drug use really, really escalated at this time and you would see a physical and personality change in him. I can tell just from listening to the tapes that he's completely different than he was back in the States. Here's why I think Jonestown wasn't what he expected it to be. Before, when he was living in San Francisco, in Indiana, in Ukiah, he could be a man who would come and swoop in, stand up front, look polished, look put together, and give his sermon, and everybody looked up to him, and it was easier for them to see him as otherworldly. Now he's living in a jungle right with these people, like right in the middle of them. He sees them every day, all the time. Anytime he steps outside of his cabin, somebody's there. This is driving him crazy because he's gaining weight, he's getting older, 
He's all messed up on amphetamines, using more than he ever has before. And he's sweating all the time. And he knows that if people see him this way, they're going to be like, uh, this isn't God. This is like some sweaty tourist who really likes to wear palm tree shirts. I'm not sure why we're here. And I'm not even sure if people actually felt that way or thought that way, but he just didn't want them to see him as human. In Jonestown, every single meeting was recorded on audio tape and I have links for these audio tapes. I'll put them in the description box if you'd like to listen to them. Some of them are entertaining, some of them are heartbreaking, some of them are hard to hear, some of them have a quality that's not so good, but if this is a subject you're actually really interested in, I do suggest listening to all of them, but be careful because there's a lot of stuff in there that if you're sensitive might upset you. I can hear the progression from when he preaches in San Francisco to when he's preaching in Jonestown. He sounds exhausted. He sounds defeated. He sounds like me when I talk to my kids after I've been working all day long and I haven't slept at all and Aiden's just like talking to me about Pokemon or Minecraft and Bella's just like yelling at me that she wants a popsicle and I'm just like, I can't do this anymore guys. I can't do this anymore. I'm so sick of it. Like he just sounds exhausted. He sounds over it. He sounds like these people are a burden to him rather than his loved ones who he's their father and he'll always be there for them. And this is definitely a parental dynamic, right? That's how you get with your kids sometimes. But these aren't really your kids. They're adults. You're an adult. And the way he would talk to them, I'll play you a little bit, but the way he would talk to them would just be like, I'm so sick of this shit. And he literally says this, like, I'm so Sick of it. I can't do this anymore. I hate these meetings. Okay. Give it to her. Give it to her. Give it to her. I'm sick of this shit. He's cracking. He's not happy here. He's becoming depressed. He used to be happy when he had the opportunity to grow and change in the States. He could get more people to come with him. Now he's in the jungle with a bunch of people he's already gotten. And what's the point? He's like bored now. But that's what I hear and that's what I sense. And I spent a lot of time with this guy over the past couple of weeks. I spent a lot of time listening to these audio tapes. I spent a lot of time reading everything he said and written. And I definitely can tell you that I believe that's exactly what he was feeling. Just depressed, like what's next? Is this it? This is it? He didn't want a socialist paradise. He wanted to be important and be somebody that everybody looked up to. He didn't want to be as somebody who just worked alongside with his people. They already looked up to him. He didn't have anything else to achieve. He didn't have anybody else to get. He's in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of people who are already indebted to him. And now he's like, what's next? So the punishments in Jonestown become meaner and more targeted, more malicious than they were before. There is a box called the box that they would put people in. It's like an isolation chamber that they built for people and they would just lock people in there. There was a pit in the ground that they dug and they'd throw people in there if they misbehaved. Then there was of course the public humiliations that kept going on and just getting worse and worse and worse. And what bothers me the most about these humiliations that happen in Jonestown is I feel like these people who came with him, they're going just as crazy as he is. They actually start taking part. They're laughing at times at these poor people. There's a woman who's deathly afraid of snakes and they take like an anaconda and Jim makes her hold this anaconda and it's like wrapping itself around her and she's literally losing her mind like her voice it sounds like she's gonna lose it she's breaking and all these people are laughing and yelling at her like now you're not gonna do this again are you like apparently this is not the first time they've put this snake on her and she has this reaction every time and Jim is like you have this reaction every time and nothing ever changes I'll play a clip for you. He wants to choke her to death. That's his bed tonight. I'm tired of it. You said the same thing the last time. Turn around, look at the people. Turn around, look at the people. Talk to them. See if they will get the snake off your back. I never did promise I wouldn't do it again. I never did promise I wouldn't do it again. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. No one did it again. I believe I she, nothing else works for this woman. Did this only last six, seven days? 
If you fed it to her, maybe it might, that might work. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Turn around. These people are getting in on it, right? They're laughing. They're like having a good time. This is the mob mentality. These are not the same good hearted people they once were. They've warped and become something darker because of Jim Jones. So he would do a lot of these punishments at these night meetings. These night meetings would last for hours. So people would get up at 6 a.m. and they would work all day long. They'd get up at 6 a.m., they'd have breakfast, which was rice. Typically, that's all they ate in Jonestown was rice because they couldn't afford real meat or protein. And he knew that people needed energy because they worked a lot. So rice it was with like some watery gravy and some like meat pieces. Who even knows what those meat pieces were? After breakfast, they would work do whatever they were doing until about six, then they would have dinner and then they would get to maybe go wash up or something and then they'd go right to the pavilion. And it's this open air pavilion where they have all their meetings and Jones always addresses them. It's got a tin roof and a raised platform. And while everybody sits on long hard benches on the floor, Jim Jones sits in his lawn chair throne on his raised pedestal. And he talks to them for hours. So they get there, it's like 6.30 probably, and he will talk to them until like 12 in the morning after they've worked all day. People are exhausted. And eventually so many people get to Jonestown, there's not even enough room for them all to sit on the benches. So some of them have to stand. People are like falling asleep. And he carried this big gun around with him most of the time. And if people would fall asleep, he would shoot it in the air. And when they would wake up startled, he'd be like, you awake now, you paying attention now? He's crazy. Most of the time they were not getting to sleep till 1.32 in the morning and then waking up, like I said, at six. And this would happen day after day after day. Hard work, listening to Jim Jones, talking over the loudspeaker constantly, listening to Jim Jones talk some more for six hours a night and then you maybe get to sleep for three hours or four hours before you're woken up to do it all over again. And you wonder why these people went absolutely insane and never questioned what was happening. They were sleep deprived. They were inundated by his voice and his presence and his face almost 24 seven. Even when they were sleeping, he played these things over the loudspeaker. This is absolutely torture. This makes people break. This makes people do things they wouldn't normally do. When there weren't punishments happening at these night meetings, the newspaper from the United States was being read aloud. So Jim could let everybody know what a bullet they dodged by leaving the United States when they did. And he obviously just made this all up, but he would actually sit up there and read the newspaper and make it up as he went along and make it look like he was reading out of the newspaper. So he would tell people that the KKK had taken over. Even their kids were wearing white hoods now. They were putting black people into concentration camps and it was horrible. You're so lucky that we don't live there anymore. We got away just in time. Jim Jones, when he arrived in Guyana, expected he would have a regular contact with the prime minister, you know, like important leader to important leader. But when he didn't have that kind of contact and he was shoved off and the deputy prime minister told him he read, he was like pissed off. He felt disrespected and he also thought maybe the prime minister's working with the United States against me. Maybe they're in collusion and that's why he won't see me. At one point during an especially tense time in the custody battle of John Victor Stone, the courts had basically ordered that Jim Jones release John Victor back to the custody of his mother and come to the United States and handle this. And he didn't want to, obviously. And then at this point, he found out Ptolemy Reed, the deputy prime minister of Guyana, was in the United States and he put two and two together in his head. So he thought in his paranoid head, well, nothing happens without me, Jim Jones, being involved. So he must be in the United States working with them to try to like catch me up. So we actually did come to believe that the Guyanese government and the American government would be working together and that they were hiding in the jungle, like armed soldiers hiding just out of sight in the jungle, waiting for the right moment to attack and come in. And he told everybody this, right? He said, they're going to come take us. They're going to kidnap our children and kill our children. They're going to take John Victor back to those horrible people, Tim and Grace. And people had started calling John Victor the child god in Jonestown. This is what they referred to him as, the child god. So they wanted to protect him just as much as Jim Jones did from being taken. So when Jim Jones told them there was people out there with guns waiting to come and attack them, they were like, okay, what do we do? Jim Jones actually had his son go out into the woods and shoot at him from the woods so that people would think that there was really somebody out there. But he didn't tell anybody with him that his son was shooting at him. It was his son and not an actual enemy. So a couple of his bodyguards actually fired back into the woods and could have killed his son 
because he's an idiot. So one day everybody's doing their normal thing, out working, and there's this huge announcement over the loudspeaker, like emergency, get back, quick, 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 they're coming, it's happening, and everybody freaks out and they like get back to the pavilion. And that's when Jim Jones and his cronies start handing out guns and basically saying like, here you go, these guns, you know, if somebody comes out to attack us, you need to shoot them. And these are people that have literally never held guns. These are people that didn't even know there was guns in Jonestown. They were like, where do these guns come from? And he posts these people up to keep an eye on the jungle for when the guerrilla warriors come out of the jungle to attack them and steal all their children and kill them all. And he has them doing this for several days. Doesn't let them leave their post, doesn't let them sleep, brings them food so they can stay there posted up. While this is happening, Jim Jones is in constant contact with Marcy back in San Francisco. And he's telling Marcy, this is it. We're not going down quiet. I'll kill everybody here before I let them come in and take us. And she's like, calm down, dude. I don't think that Reed is here for that, but I'll find him and, and let him tell you himself. So she actually had to search the entire United States and track this guy down. She finally did track him down in Indiana of all places, which is crazy. She had to put him on the phone with Jim so that Ptolemy Reed could tell him like, dude, chill out. I'm hearing something completely different. It has nothing to do with you or your custody battle. Nobody's coming to get you. But Jones didn't believe him, right? He didn't believe him. So the day that he is set by court order to return John Victor to his mother, Jones orders everybody to march through the jungle to Port Ketuma, miles and miles and miles. And a lot of these people are old or kids. Miles and miles through the jungle to Port Ketuma where he says there's a boat waiting and there it's gonna take them to Cuba. So they actually start like getting on this boat, but one of the elderly women slips, probably because she's exhausted from her seven mile trek through the woods. She slips and she breaks her hip. They phone or radio Jones back at Jonestown and let him know what happened. And Jones is like, all right, turn around, march everybody back through the woods, come home. Never said anything about it again. Never was like, sorry guys that we were gonna get on a boat to Cuba, but then we didn't. Acted like it never happened. Finally, when everybody's back, he still keeps the fear of urgency going, even though he knows it's kind of okay. The siege lasted for six days. The siege that he said they were being attacked, it lasted for six days till he finally called it off and said, we won. We won, guys. What did they win? What did they win? Nobody knows, but he just said, we won, and it's over. They would call it the six-day siege, but Jim Jones would call this the very first ever white knight. From there on, Jim basically took any small issue and blew it up into something super dramatic. But life was going on here. Babies were being born, people were having a good time, there were houses being built. Even the Guyanese natives would leave their babies that were just born at the gates of Jonestown because they wanted their children to have the benefits that the Americans had. The Guyanese government would send people in from time to time to check and make sure everything was on the up and up. And these representatives would be led through a carefully staged visit, going only to buildings that had already been staged and set up, talking only to people who had already been coached, and they were fed lavishly, even though there wasn't any food in the temple to be had for anybody else. While they sat and ate their meat and dessert, they were entertained by the Jonestown Kids Choir and the very talented Jonestown Band. However, when the U.S. Embassy visited, they were not treated as well. They were treated as the enemy because that's what Jim Jones told everybody they were. The State Department had been inundated with letters and calls from the concerned relatives who were worried about their family in Jonestown. And the visits would become more common in the fall of 1977, but every time the U.S. Embassy visited, the People's Temple would cry religious discrimination and threaten lawsuits for preventing them from practicing their religious beliefs. And eventually the Guyanese government and the US government kind of decided that this isn't really worth it. Everything seems to be fine and the more we keep pushing these people and going in and bothering them, the more likely we are to open ourselves up to a lawsuit. But Congressman Leo Ryan was not convinced. He didn't necessarily believe that every single person who lived in Jonestown wanted to be there. He talked extensively with a lot of the previous members as well as Grace and Tim Stone and the stories that they told him didn't really jive with what everybody else said was happening in People's Temple at that time. He wanted to see for himself. That was the kind of person he was. He was kind of like a badass. He needed to see 
for himself if there was people that needed his help and if there were people that needed his help, he was gonna help them. And Grace and Tim were still fighting so hard for the return of their son. There was a lot of resentment in Tim from everything that had happened. He had actually looked up to Jim at one point. He actually believed in him at one point and when he saw that Jim wasn't the guy that he thought he was, he was just a human, he was pissed, he resented him. Not only did he want his son back, but there was an old and bitter resentment that had built in Tim once he had seen Jim Jones for who he truly was. Not God, not a prophet, not superhuman, just a mentally ill man who had used his power and persuasion to destroy his marriage, his life, and sleep with his wife. The defection of Tim Stone and his following legal battles gave Jim Jones a face to put on the unknown enemy he had before been dangling in front of his congregates. Now they had a face. They had somebody that they could hate. He blamed Tim for all the past things they'd had to endure. All the punishments, all the really bad protocols and programs that had been enacted had been Tim Stone's fault. And during one of his extended night meetings, he gave everybody a piece of paper and had them write down how they would kill Tim Stone, when and if they had the option to. With everything going on, Jones began to set the groundwork for the final white night. Now these people had endured white night after white night. This was always a practice suicide of some kind. I think that I read they went through something like 82 white nights in a year before the final one. 82 in a year. That's several times a week. They were being prepared and almost put through the routine of expecting this to happen. So that when it did happen, it was just part of the routine for them. This was just what they did. The final white night though was when he planned to end everybody's life. So he would up the occurrences of the white knights, keeping them on their toes. Every so often he would sprinkle in the idea of mass suicide, see how they reacted to it. It started off just as like a general, you know, would you rather like die or have our kids taken from us? Wouldn't it be better to just kill ourselves rather than to let them kill us? Wouldn't that be better? So he would start off kind of just generally like that, see how people would respond, see what would happen, what they would say. And then eventually, at one of these white nights, he brought out vats of this dark red liquid and he told everybody to fill up a cup, that there was poison in the liquid and within 45 minutes they would be dead because they were coming for them, it was happening, it was happening now, we have to do this. Now understand there had been a lot of people who were part of his California you're poisoned, JK, you're not poisoned kind of thing and they had told people so a lot of these people drinking the liquid willingly were just assuming it was another practice test. And it was just a test because after they drank it, Jones proudly proclaimed, this was just a loyalty test you all passed. Thank you so much, you're amazing. You can take the rest of the day off and relax now as a reward for your loyalty in drinking poison that would have killed you. Everybody who's exhausted and just kind of like mentally upside down right now, just they stare at him blankly and they're like, what just happened? And then the next morning, Jones once again hands out paper because he wants them always to do essays. He wants them always to write essays. He hands out all this paper, even though there's no paper for toilet paper, he hands them paper and he says, write what you would have felt and what you would have done if last night had been the last white night. So he's literally indoctrinating them at this time, like just getting them ready for the time where he actually pulls this. And they're being so twisted in their brains, they don't even know what's happening. Even though this seemed like just another game to Jim Jones, it wasn't a game. He took this very seriously. He took it as a confirmation that he could in fact pull this off at a mass level. and He would forever be remembered, not as a failure who had been able to pull off a social paradise in the jungle, not as a bandit on the run from the US government, but as a great man who'd made the grandest sacrifice by giving his life and the life of his people for his cause. That night, Jim Jones had Larry Schott order a pound of cyanide for the amount of $8.85, and this was enough cyanide to make 1,800 lethal doses. All this time, he's not telling people that his end goal is to have them die. He's telling them that they're in talks with Russia. They're talking to Russia. Russia's gonna let them move there. This whole white night thing, it's a last resort. But don't worry, Russia's definitely gonna let us in. Now, in fact, they were talking to Russia, but Russia had no interest in letting them in. They, this was a game to Russia. Russia thought they were funny. I mean, there was actually a Russian diplomat who visited the compound and was like, you guys are way more socialist than we even are. We should take 
note from you. We should learn from you guys how to be socialist because of how serious they were about it, the Russians kind of took it as a joke and they weren't going to let them in to Russia because if they were, they would have. They would have told them yes and they never did. They kept asking, can we go to Russia? Can we immigrate there? And they were just like, well, we're still waiting to hear back about it. It was just to put them off. They never plan on letting them live in Russia. They didn't want these crazy ass people living in Russia. They were like, you're more communist than we are. Tim Stone is hitting the temple with lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. Like he's not giving up. He's not backing down. He's just going to try to smoke Jim Jones out. Jim Jones can't go back to the U.S. to handle these in person like he's supposed to or he'll be arrested. But he can't not address them because not addressing them will also put a warrant out for his arrest. As on the road, look on